Theatre Phonic presents Rubber Dub Dub, a short story written by Emmeline Brayfield, read by Peter M. Smith. The sun rose apologetically over the dense fog, barely raising the temperature at water level. The muted lapping against the rowing boat gave a rhythm to the passenger's sleep. The salty haze, which had sat like a layer of blue snow over the seaside town for what felt like weeks now, pressed in on the ears and muffled the senses, giving life a dreamlike quality. It made it difficult to know whether you were awake or asleep, unable to really connect with the surrounding world. It also meant that the castaways had no idea how far they were from shore, and no way of being seen. There was no point calling for help, as every sound was instantly deadened. A fish jumped from the water near the bow of the boat, sprinkling the man with the moustache with cold water and startling him awake. Bolt upright and numb all over, it took a few seconds for him to remember. But he did remember. How could he avoid remembering? He was surrounded by the stuff. It clung to his skin, permeated his clothes and gummed up his eyes every night. It was stuck to every hair in his nostrils, so every breath he took was a reminder of where he was. Wiping the crystals from the corner of his eyes, he stretched and enjoyed the cracking that rippled up his spine. This morning stretch was one of the few pleasures left to him, so he always woke up ahead of the others so that he could enjoy it completely uninterrupted. It was hard to do anything alone here. He had forgotten what it was like to have a solitary thought anymore. He had even started dreaming of their faces. He was pretty sure they all snored in unison too. His companions' chests were rising in time with each other right now their heads lolling at the same angle. It had been so long he had forgotten how they got here. He remembered the pub. He remembered trying out a new extra strong beer and he remembered, vaguely, dancing with two particularly beautiful women until he was informed that they were in fact pillars. Then it went blank and he had woken up severely dehydrated with water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. Stretching once more, his hand automatically moved to his upper lip, where stood his pride and joy. Years of growth, love and care had given him a glorious handlebar moustache. Normally, it stretched out to his cheekbones with a curl that was a triumphant flourish of whisker. He was extremely proud of his moustache and its bushy black shininess. He curled it every morning, treated it with oils every evening, and only ever let his trusted barber cut it. He proudly claimed to anyone who would listen that his moustache defined him better than his chosen life's profession. The worst thing about his job was having to wear a hairnet over his lip. Stupid supermarket health and safety regulations. He regularly had the local teenagers standing on the other side of the counter, making rude gestures. Whenever they did, he would make a great show of rolling up his sleeves and picking up his cleaver. Once they saw his arms covered with tattoos and scars, they generally shut up. He smiled at the fond memories of their terrified faces. Sometimes he would leave his arms covered in blood, just to really make them scared. Then again, he didn't have much to be proud of anymore. Lack of conditioner and combing had reduced his treasured whiskers to a mass of badly textured fuzz. He had no chance in next week's best moustache competition. Or had the competition already happened? Time had no meaning out here. Bringing himself back to the present, he let out a deep sigh and looked out into the fog. He waved a feeble hand at the tendrils weaving their way toward him. They fled away ahead of his touch like disturbed birds. 
It really did feel as if it were alive, snaking around the passengers, working its way into their every thought like it was possessing them. A shiver ran down his back. He gave a quick nudge to the man with the nose ring next to him, who fell off his bench and set the boat rocking. The man with the nose ring wondered how come he kept falling off his bench as he woke, despite having safely balanced throughout his sleep. He supposed it must be his body's ingenious way of trying to wake him up. He shook his head from side to side, making his cheeks flap, pretending to be a cartoon character in order to avoid the inevitable embarrassment of having fallen out of one's bed. At least, the plank that one is using as a makeshift bed. The man with the moustache was sitting on his own plank, gazing into the interminable distance. The man with the nose ring frowned slightly at his companion, wondering what he was seeing through the waves of fog. The girl with the crutch was still lightly snoring, so he took his chance to have a good nose pick. Having a nose ring led to an inevitable additional build-up of snot overnight, and it was always relieving to have a nice morning route around. Like the man with the moustache, the man with the nose ring couldn't remember many details of the events leading up to their current situation. Not that it really mattered. They were here and there seemed little way of escape. He thought about the last meal he had had and regretted it instantly. Even a day without food is tough for a man habituated to five square meals a day. That and being surrounded by baked goods at work. He was a baker through simplicity rather than choice. His father had run a bakery and, having bought his only son up knowing all the family secrets, his last dying wish had been that the family business should keep running. The man with the nose ring had done as his father begged because it meant he didn't have to bother with A-levels and he could just walk downstairs and be in the office. The very early risers had been horrific in the beginning. But he was quick to bring in a manager to take over the 3am starts. From then on, he had lions every morning and pastries whenever he wanted. He was never any good at serving the customers. And due to recent events, it had become pretty much impossible. So he just sat in the back office signing papers and taste testing. Now he had to remain squarely in the middle of the boat to make sure it didn't tip over. Having a back office job had the added benefit of meaning he could avoid people. School hadn't been easy. Pastry Pig was the kindest of his nicknames. He had tried sport to lose weight, but he was just, well, useless at it. He ended up with his face in the mud more often than kicking the football. His mother wasn't any help either. Any time he tried to discuss diet, she would insist that you're perfect the way you are, and that it was only puppy fat. He had given up trying to tell her that at 19 years of age, he was no longer a puppy. He looked over to the girl peacefully snoozing. Even in sleep, she had her grey coat drawn closely around her. Her black hair was knotted and greasy, and her eye makeup was smudged against her skin, giving her the look of a lovelorn teenager. She had an odd beauty to her, though she was far too thin. Definitely needed a baguette or four, but she was nice. She hadn't judged him at all and just smiled at him warmly. He had been having a slight panic attack the previous morning, and she had held his hand until he felt calmer. As he watched, her tongue caught in her throat and she coughed herself awake. Embarrassed that he had been staring at her, he hastily twisted on the bench to look out into the water. Choking yourself awake is bad enough normally. Doing it in a boat in front of two strangers is just depressing. The girl with the crutch chastised herself. It wasn't fair to call them strangers. She had known them for long enough now. They hadn't really talked. At all. But that didn't make them... Stranger strangers. There was something that linked them all together now, whether or not they actually talked. 
She leaned over the side of the boat and trailed her fingers in the water. A few seconds of enjoying the cool waves lapping against her skin, and she quickly retracted them and wiped her hand on her jeans, remembering that she had no idea what lay underneath the surface. A shiver went down her spine. The girl with the crutch, unlike her companions, could remember most of the events that had put them in this situation. Much good that it did them. She hadn't shared the details of that night, mainly because they hadn't asked. They wouldn't think to ask, and she didn't see the point in letting them know. The situation was bad enough without further depressing them, and they seemed like such nice people. She had never had too many friends. People always seemed to shy away from her. Maybe she had a funny face. Or terrible dress sense. Either way, she had become used to spending most of her time alone. So the night she had met her companions had been an unusual and surprisingly enjoyable event. One thing had led to pushing the boat out. And here they were. She smiled at the thought of what her parents would say. Irresponsible and naive came to mind. But she hadn't had a drop to drink. Drinking wasn't a great idea in her condition. It tended to lead to even more falling over than usual. A small giggle escaped her lips, which was quickly smothered by the fog. She frowned. It was the feel of the fog that really bothered her. It was heavy on her and made her feel like she was wearing damp seaweed instead of clothes. She was starting to scare herself, so moved her thoughts to her latest pottery design. She had become interested in pottery in her design technology classes. It was her form of meditation when things got too much. She liked the feel of the clay hardening against her fingers, the sloppy noise as she squished the shapes together, and the smell of her creations gently baking. Her favourite things to make were candelabras. She could have intricate twists and delicate detail in the knowledge that the shadows from a flickering candle would make each etching look like it was moving. She started selling bits to her schoolmates, and by the end of her GCSEs, she had a flourishing business. So, despite getting straight A's in her exams and her mother deciding that she should be a lawyer, she had chosen to start her own range of pottery. Her parents were, well, disappointed was one way of putting it. There were a lot of sit-down chats and a fair amount of shouting. Their attitudes changed, however, once they saw her first year's turnover. Her father was now her accountant and had stopped talking about when she would get a boyfriend. Well... Almost. She turned to the man with the moustache as he yawned widely and shifted in his seat, making the boat rock gently. Quietly she sighed and wondered whether a fish would be so kind as to jump into the boat and deep fry itself with some chips. Her stomach rumbled. The man with the nose ring's stomach grumbled in sympathy. He glanced across at her, smiling then quickly looked away, embarrassed. He had never been very good with girls. He could never find the words. He smoked again, this time with irony. Then his stomach gave an almighty groan, and he clutched at his midriff to pacify the cramps rippling through him. The man with the moustache saw his gesture and looked up with empathy, and an expression that said a thousand words. Or seven, at least. We need to get out of here. The man with the nose ring nodded so fervently that the man with the moustache let out a sharp laugh. The girl with the crutch jumped in surprise at the sound and then grabbed the sides of the boat, trying to stem the alarming swaying she had caused. Once she had recovered herself, she said, We really need to get out of here. Are you enjoying Theatrephonic's plays? Do you want more content? Well, on the Theatrephonic Patreon, we have 
ad-free episodes, blooper reels, and Q&A sessions, as well as the opportunity to watch the live recordings and name a character in a play. Visit patreon.com forward slash theatrephonic for more information. That's patreon.com forward slash theatrephonic to get more of what you love. Bum, bum. Once they had discovered that the only thing of use on board was a pot filled with now heavily rationed rainwater, they had each taken it upon themselves to check their own pockets for potential items to aid an escape. A lighter was the girl with the crutches' most likely piece of equipment, although the flame didn't last long in the damp. The man with the moustache had a notebook in his back pocket, and the man with the nose ring had a handful of coins. None of them even had a watch or a phone. They had been trying to tell the time by the sun, but the fog refracted the light and made it hard to even tell where the sun was. Plus, as their main form of entertainment had been balling themselves up and sleeping to conserve warmth and energy, it was difficult to distinguish any length of time. She had considered suggesting huddling together for body heat, but wasn't particularly sure whether she really wanted to do that. None of them had a clue how they were going to use their inventory to find dry land. But the man with the nose ring had enjoyed the diversion of counting his change. It was either that, frantically paddling or just staring out at the horizon. Actually, he wasn't sure whether anyone had tried any frantic paddling yet. He contemplated suggesting it, but then dismissed the idea as he didn't particularly fancy doing any physical work himself especially after so long without food. The man with the moustache was flicking through his notebook. He hadn't let the others look at it. It was a day-to-day journal of his moustache. Its length, that day's style, products used, any comments received. Although he was extremely proud of his whiskers, he didn't want anyone knowing that he kept a diary about it. They would think he was weird. They wouldn't understand. He was thumbing through the pages now, looking back at compliments he had received in the last facial hair festival he'd been to. That had been a wonderful day. He glanced up at his overweight companion who also happened to be shaven-headed. A beard on him would really smarten him up. Get rid of the baby face too. He made a mental note to tell the young man Maybe when he looked a bit less forlorn. They spent the whole day in silence, gazing out at nothing or into the water, and tugging their clothes closer around them in a desperate bid for warmth, wishing that they were an engineer or in any way able to make a propeller. The light slowly dimmed and they were getting desperate. The girl with the crutch was really starting to worry. She didn't know how much longer they would survive with so little water. She felt faint with thirst, and she hadn't recently been suffering from a hangover, unlike her companions. She shivered violently, and, to her horror, couldn't stop. Her whole body was being racked with shudders of cold. She scrunched up her face against the pane and wrapped her arms tightly around herself, but nothing would stop it. The man with the nose ring was the first to see and stood up as carefully as possible. Rather than risk tipping the boat over, he reached out and gently pulled her across to his middle bench, hugging her tightly. The man with the moustache saw what he was doing and squeezed alongside them. He rubbed his hands up and down her back and arms, hoping to create some heat. Finding the action futile, he joined in the hug and stayed there until her shivers gradually subsided. They remained in that huddle as the last of the light softly filtered out of the fog. The temperature dropped sharply. Although they would tell everybody afterwards that it was to share body heat, each of them was also enjoying the touch of another person, as well as the sensation of really being needed. The night had nestled in around them 
and the girl with the crutch suddenly became desperate for a smoke. She had shared her last cigarette with the others the previous day and hadn't really thought about it since then. But now she couldn't get it out of her head. She played with the lighter in her hands as a distraction, eventually clicking the flame into existence and enjoying a sharp shock of heat against her fingers before she let it go out again. Over and over she sparked it, completely unaware that her companions were staring, as if hypnotised, at the flame. She lit it once more and all of a sudden they were bathed in white light, brighter than anything they had ever known. A huge wind sprang up around them, causing the fog to dance madly about the boat. They clung to each other tighter than ever and covered their eyes, all sharing the same thought. It's God. We're dead. Rubber Dub Dub. Missing three found alive and well. The story which has captivated our town for the last 48 hours came to a dramatic close last night with a fog hampered helicopter rescue. Three people disappearing in the same night from the same bar is enough to stir anyone's interest, and after the alarm was raised on Sunday morning, hundreds of people came together in a heartwarming search for their neighbours throughout the local area. Hope was beginning to fade by Monday afternoon, however, with the poor visibility dampening everyone's spirits. Mrs. Crabb, who lives in Pentry Close, told us, We live next door to dear Thomas and wanted to help find him, but when you can't see your own hand in front of your face, it would be next to impossible to see a body. As Monday came to a close, however, a chance call from the Bubblegum Amusement Park, which sits less than a mile from the pub where the three were last seen, alerted the police to a missing rowing boat. A search and rescue helicopter was immediately dispatched to the kilometre-long lake which sits in the centre of the popular theme park's grounds. Despite the visibility issues, the boat was quickly found, and the three were airlifted to hospital where they are being treated for severe dehydration, but mercifully nothing worse. A statement was released late this morning by Bubblegum Amusement Park. We are thankful that the three missing persons have been found and that we were able to assist in their safe return to their families. Due to the density of the fog over the weekend, CCTV has not been able to shed any light on how they managed to enter the park and push the rowing boat out, or why they removed the oars before boarding. Due to the unique circumstances, Bubblegum has decided not to press charges against the three but instead extend them warm invitations to join us during our opening hours. When asked whether they would be allowed back on the lake, the spokeswoman smiled and said, maybe with a chaperone. The story of the victims, who apparently only met on Saturday night, has become one of amazement as details of their individual circumstances came to light. Thomas McAvoy, who worked at the meat counter in Asda, and is a very familiar face to many of us, is completely deaf. According to one of the nurses treating Mr. McAvoy, he was the worst affected by the adventure, his dehydration leading him to believe that he and his passengers had been on board the rowing boat for weeks. Simon Pond, the young owner of Pond's Pastries, which we all know and love, accidentally bit half his tongue off in a bicycle accident three months ago, leaving him unable to speak. His mother Mary Pond told me, Poor Simon hasn't learned sign language yet. Normally I give him a pen and paper to message us, but he lost it during Saturday evening. As Tom can't lip-read, the men were only able to communicate with gestures over their whole time aboard. Of course, that was no use at all to Jemima. Jemima Preet, a local potter, indeed found communicating extremely hard with her two shipmates as she is blind. Detective Inspector Reed, who has been presiding over the investigation, told our reporters. Miss Preet somehow lost her seeing cane during Saturday night, but it appears that her colleagues obtained a replacement, which she was using for the rest of the night. Mr. Sanders, who lost his leg during the Falklands, was extremely pleased to have his crutch returned to him. This, of course, meant that Tom, Simon and Jemima could barely communicate at all throughout their 48-hour ordeal. According to Mrs. Preet, Jemima's mother, 
Tom and Simon shared a few looks here and there. Simon could hear Jemima speaking and make gestures to Tom. Tom and Jemima communicated through touch. A police source has told us that according to witnesses in the fisherman's catch, the bar where the three were last seen, the two men were inebriated by the time they left. They both claim to be unable to remember anything but flashes from the evening and say that they didn't even know that the lake in the bubblegum theme park existed. Our source added that all three companions, possibly due to the saltiness of the fog, were convinced that they were stranded out to sea. Mr. Michael Kensington, a regular at the Fisherman's Catch, told us that he joined in a conversation with the two men which involved writing messages to each other about childhood fishing memories. It was Mr. Kensington who introduced Jemima to the men. She was sat next to us and looked all lonely, so I had a quick chat with her and introduced her to Si and Tom. Not that they could really talk to her. I popped to the loo, and when I came back, she was leaving the bar with them. I didn't think twice about it. Tom and Simon are both gentle as anything, so I assumed they were getting her home. God knows how they managed to get into the boat, though. Miss Preet's father has apparently requested both men's arrest for kidnap, but Jemima has denied any wrongdoing on their parts, saying that she was happy to go along with them as she had been having fun, but she had no idea that they were breaking and entering. D.I. Reed has confirmed that the three will remain in hospital for a few more days to recover from their ordeal. When asked for his thoughts on the case, he said, Hopefully, this will be taken as a cautionary tale to anyone considering similar adventures. Forty-eight hours freezing cold on board a rowing boat is not my idea of a good time. It is a shame, however, that we are unlikely to ever learn how come, despite being severely dehydrated, None of the three ever thought to check whether the water around them was truly brine. Bayada. 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 You've been listening to Rubber Dub Dub, a short story written by Emmeline Brayfield, read by Peter M. Smith, produced by Cat on a Piano Productions. The theatrephonic theme tune was composed by Jackson Pentland, performed by Jackson Pentland, Molly Fife Taylor, and Emmeline Brayfield. For more information about the theatrephonic podcast, go to catonapiano.uk forward slash theatrephonic, tweet or Instagram us at theatrephonic, or visit our Facebook page. If you enjoy theatrephonic and would like to get more content, please consider supporting us by visiting patreon.com forward slash theatrephonic. Please don't forget to rate and review. Thank you for listening.